Great, thank you very much and, and welcome to you this morning. Um, I'd like to begin with a, a prayer that is taken from this book, if you can see it. It's called Seven Sacred Pauses by uh, Marie, Macrina Wiedercare. As we listen to this prayer, as we join her in prayer, let's begin as we always do in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. O God of all, all peoples, all nations, all seasons, all years, all hours and days, you who have invited us to love, hear our cry. Listen to our prayer. Make our spirits free, our hearts open, our minds healthy, and our souls awake. Then we will be able to love as you have asked, with all our hearts, all our minds, all our souls. The all is frightening. Yet in our deepest moments of truth, we know that this is what we desire, O God of all. Hear us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. It was wonderful having some connections, hearing of some people who are uh, listening both near and far. And yesterday we had our, our first couple of excursions into the wonderful beauty of the Psalms. And I hope you had uh, a pleasant evening, um, a good night's sleep, and that the Psalms were um, a source of, of life and joy for you. Um, I'll give you a minute if anyone has any comments, things that you want to bring up from, uh, from yesterday, maybe insights or questions, uh, prayers, anything at all. Thank you. Um, yesterday, the part on the resounding voice of God being qual, I live by a very noisy creek that's high up in the mountains in the spring. It's very, very noisy as it gets higher. And a couple times a day, you'll hear the boulders crashing and rolling. And you never see them, but you hear them echo down the river. And that word qual, that loud sound, just reminded me of that. And so I'm going to think of that he word, that Hebrew word, when I hear that. Wonderful, wonderful. And, and we can hear that kol, kol in so many different ways. Uh, maybe it's a, a, a cry, a sound of nature, something that's not as dramatic as the example you gave. But thank you. I think that we can start listening to the resounding voice of God in nature all around us. Yeah, thank you. Anyone else? Uh, just a couple of things. The um, a bit about silence and listening reminded me of the scene of um, Elijah in the cave. Uh, yes. God was not in the, the storm and not in the lightning, but in that small, still sound. Yes. Um, then the other thought that came to me was a, a fourth level of shalom that I've sometimes heard about, and that's being in harmony or balance with our environment, whether that's this world in which we live or the beautiful hermitage you, space you've created for yourself or my rather messy desk back in Yakima, <laughs> <laughs> trying to find that harmony and balance in life uh, in the world in which we live is so important. Right. Thank you. That That is really important um, in any age, but I think particularly today, we're very aware of the environment and, and uh, the need for caring for it that will bring peace, that will bring wholeness and harmony uh, to the world around us. Yes, thank you. I, I think that that brilliant comment came because you had such excellent teachers in your seminary years. <laughs> Anyone else? I feel like Jerry Springer here. <laughs> <laughs> yes, come forward and confess your sins for the public. <laughs> All right, I think that's it. Okay. Great, thank you, thank you very much. So yesterday we had just some general introductory aspects of the Psalms, the notion of mutual listening, 
listening sometimes to the call and other times to the still small voice, to the silence, recognizing the word of God, that dabar, all of the ways that God communicates with us that we see not only in the Psalms, but we see in our life experiences. Today, we're going to begin with one Psalm, and it's a Psalm that um, is not in the morning or evening prayer in the Liturgy of the Hours, but it should be. Um, it's the Psalm that is the first one in the Psalter, and it's it's a, a beautiful um, introduction to all of the prayers. So we're going to spend some time with it. And I'd like to begin our reflection by looking at an image. And that's on page nine of your handouts where you see that, that doorway. One of the participants is asking, um, do you know what that picture, that door is? It, where is that taken? I don't know. I found it when I was looking through pictures of doors on on the internet, and this is the one that I chose. Oh, okay. Well, they, they felt but, some deja vu when they saw it. They thought they had been there at one point. So it, Yes, and someone else had asked me that before, and I went back and tried to find it, and it disappeared. I couldn't, I couldn't find where I where I'd, uh, located it in the first place. So if anyone finds that, maybe you can, can let us know. It's the yes, door to heaven. Okay. Yeah, yeah, it is. So the, the title there says, Entering the Prayers of Praise. And then the verse, come into God's presence, singing for joy. So walking through that doorway has the sense of entering both into God's presence and entering into this wonderful collection of prayers. And I've spent a, a bit of time just reflecting on this doorway and how it can offer some insights on prayer. First of all, it's wide open. We can enter it quite easily. But the path isn't totally smooth. Um, knowing how often I trip on just something that is a very small difference in the pathway, it's easy to trip even as we enter that doorway. And that can happen to us. Whether we feel tripped up by certain verses from the Psalms and that makes us feel uneasy or puzzled, or tripping up simply in our life's journey. I also noted that there are lamps so that if we enter into this doorway, even if it's nighttime, that there will be something to guide us. There will be lamps to show us the way. And there are plants growing. As we enter this door, we will find such life, sometimes in surprising places, it made me wonder if all of those plants were put there deliberately or if somehow they just sort of sprang up, flourishing, as we heard about the just flourishing uh, yesterday. It also struck me that there are little doorways off to the side so that sometimes when we enter a certain prayer, enter a certain experience, we go off in another direction. We weren't intending to do that, but after all, the door was there. Let's see where it leads. You might want to spend a little bit of time this day or any other day just looking at that picture and see, is, are there any other insights or even questions or feelings that arise as you meditate on this picture? As you look at the picture and think about it, would you listen to a few selections, verses from the book of Revelation? Chapter 3, the Holy One, the True, the One who holds the key of David, who opens and no one shall close, says to us, Behold, I have left an open door for you, which no one can close, and says further, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Those who hear my voice and open the door, then I will enter their house and dine with them and they with me. I think that calls for an amen. Amen. 
If anyone has any comments on that image, new insights or questions or experiences, um, uh, you're welcome to share them either now or further along if, uh, if you would like to. Yes, please. To me, the archways and the uh, columns speak of strength. Ah. It's entering, entering into strength. Good, thank you. Do you know, your, your comment opens up an awareness that any picture, whether it's art or the picture that I simply have looking outside the window, is always open to more. There's always more possibility. So thank you. I hadn't thought of that or seen it, and now you've opened up a new insight. The reason that I chose an image of a door in the first place was because of a comment made by St. Jerome. So if you turn the page and look at the, the next one, page 10, with the title, The Choicest of Psalms, referring to Psalm 1, You'll see that St. Jerome said that this psalm is the main entrance into the mansion of the Psalter. If we want to enter into all of the prayers of the Psalms, here's how we go in. It's the entryway. And as an entryway, it's a magnificent one, much like the picture that was chosen. One that opens up such rich possibilities for the entirety of the Psalter. Walter Brueggemann, a wonderful uh, biblical scholar, biblical detective, and a uh, great spiritual writer, refers to it as a prologue to set the tone for the entire hymnic collection. Setting the tone. So a certain feeling, a certain spirit that we get as we read, as we pray Psalm 1. And then a Jewish commentator, Rabbi Yudan of the fourth century, simply referred to it as the choicest of all Psalms. If you're dining out and you want to find the absolute best thing on the menu, you might ask the, the waiter, you know, what's the choicest thing on the menu? Well, the choicest thing on the menu of the Psalms, according to Rabbi Yudan, is this Psalm 1. As I mentioned, you know, we don't have it either in our morning or evening prayer, but I think it would be appropriate from time to time to add it or use it as a, a substitution for another psalm so that we get the, the beauty, the richness, um, and the tone that this psalm sets for us. So let's begin by praying it together um, on your handout. I don't know if... Um, I will be able to hear you, but you will be able to hear each other as we pray this psalm together. Let's remember what we talked about yesterday. Remember that word selah? That is uh, this notation, perhaps a hymnic notation that suggests that we pause. Um, so let's just have a tiny pause between each of the verses to let the words really sink in. Blessed the one who does not walk according to the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the way of sinners, nor sit in company with scoffers. Rather, the Torah of the Lord is that person's delight, God's law meditated on day and night. That one is like a tree rooted deeply near streams of water that yields fruit in season, its leaves never, never wither, and whatever it produces thrives. Not so the wicked, they are like chaff driven by the wind. Therefore the wicked will not survive judgment, nor will sinners in the assembly of the just. The Lord knows the way of the just, but the way of the wicked is lost. Almost every word, every phrase in this psalm can be looked at as a sort of a, a prism, a window, in which we get an insight into the entirety of, of the collection, this doorway 
the tone, the prologue. There's a, a comparable uh, passage in scripture that might give us some insight on how we can use Psalm 1. If you know the Gospel of John, it begins with, with this beautiful hymn called a prologue. Do you remember? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. And many biblical commentators, and actually people of prayer and faith, look at that hymn in the same way that our uh, commentators have looked at, at Psalm 1. This hymn, the beginning of John's gospel, is an entrance into the entirety of the gospel. It sets the tone. It's the prologue. It's the choicest part of the gospel. And they suggest that as we read the gospel, if ever we have a question, we don't understand something that's in John's gospel, go back to the prologue, and that will give you an insight. I think we can do the same thing with Psalm 1. As we're reading other passages and we're, we're wondering, well, how does this fit in? What does this mean? What does this say? We might go back to Psalm 1 and we will often find an answer. Maybe not always, but it does give us a way of having a kind of an overview and a guide for the entirety of the Psalter. Sometimes I, I think about the, the different passages in scripture or uh, verses that I read and I, I think, if I had written this, I might have done it differently. Probably if I were designing the Psalter, I wouldn't have started it by reference to a bunch of bad people, wicked sinners and scoffers. I probably would have wanted to begin this wonderful collection of hymns by talking about those who are good and who are virtuous. Well, we get to them. But it's significant that it opens with such descriptions, those who are wicked and sinners and scoffers. Why would it begin this way? It appears that the Psalms, faith, and life is always giving us choices. And this is giving us a choice. With whom do we want to associate? Are we going to walk with those who are wicked? Are we going to stand with the sinners? Are we going to sit with those who are scoffers? In other words, are they going to be my life's companions? That's my choice. It was providential, I think, that as I was working on this particular topic, one of my brothers told me something that had just happened to him. He had run across a, a man. I started to say a young man, but the reason he ran across him is that they were, were both preparing to celebrate their 50th anniversary from, from uh, high school. So these young men happened to run into each other. They had gone to different high schools, but they were both preparing for, uh, for their celebrations. And this man, whom he hadn't seen since grade school, gave him a card. And on the card, it said his name and then Colonel, United States Army, retired. Colonel, United States Army, retired. And my brother said, gosh, you know, I remember back in grade school days, you were really kind of wild. And he says, oh, you should have seen me in high school. I associated with a wild bunch and we started robbing places. We robbed stores. We went into any place we thought we could give, get money. And we even had guns. He said, happily, I never shot anybody, but they were a bunch of wild, immoral, out of control friends. He was walking, sitting, standing with them. So they were caught and he was brought before a judge. And the judge looked at him and said, I know who you are. You went to a Catholic school. You were raised in a strong family. What are you thinking? I'm giving you a choice. You can go to jail or you can join the army. His choice was to join the army. And he changed his associates. He changed his life. 
He made that choice. All of us have choices, maybe not so dramatic. But the Psalter begins by reminding us that we have choices in whom we make our life's companions. If you uh, look on your handout on the bottom of the page, it gives some uh, descriptions of who these people are. Wicked. They are arrogant, characterized by arrogance, pride, vainglorious, bluster, etc., etc., I was writing down these descriptions from a scholar who wrote on the the Psalms, Nahum Sarna, and I didn't have enough room to write down all of the characteristics. He summarized them by saying they are unlovely characteristics. He said further that the wicked might be characterized as those who live in practical atheism, Practical atheism. Have you ever heard that term before? What it means is not necessarily that someone identifies himself or herself, saying, I'm an atheist, but they are living that way. They are living as if there is no God, as if there is no relationship with the divine, as if our brothers and sisters are not created in God's image. Those are the wicked and sinners who are choosing to walk away from the path of God, and scoffers, mockers, cynics, outrageously and even proudly insolent. Sarna goes off, uh, goes further in talking about the scoffers. He said, we often find scoffers in groups. It's easier to be a scoffer if you are associating with others like you. They deride traditional values that society upholds. And he says, those who sit with them, as it says, to sit in the company of scoffers, do so because they're drawn by curiosity or a desire to be entertained by their outrageous mockery. We have a choice. If Psalm 1 is this entry into the Psalter, we'll see how often that choice is set before us. That we choose to walk the path with God. We choose to live in accordance with God's designs, with God's plan, in accordance with the Torah. Um, We will find over and over various descriptions. They're not always described as wicked sinners and scoffers. But I think from human experience, we know that they are so many that we have a great variety of terms with which to call them. Some of them I can't repeat on this video, but you might think of some of the ways that these people are described and the way they tend to describe others. So we're given this choice. And if we want to be truly blessed, we associate ourselves and we behave in a way that is counter that is different from standing, walking, and sitting with the wicked, the sinners, and scoffers. As the psalm says, rather, we do something else. We we don't associate with them. But we will be blessed if we do something different. The very first word in the psalm, the first word then in the Psalter, is the word that we translate as blessed or blessed. If you look then on the next page, the way of blessing, in the little box, it gives just a a, a little hint about the word's meaning. The first word in the Psalter, the the Hebrew, is asherah. So that's Hebrew, and it's equivalent to the first word that Jesus uses in the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus speaking in Greek, makarios. So both the book of Psalms and the way that Jesus begins his great sermon, this sermon that is the guide for all all living, both of them begin with beatitude. Psalm 1 and Psalm 2 are closely connected, and Psalm 2 also ends with the beatitude. And so the, the two Psalms together create this atmosphere of beatitude, setting the tone. The tone of the Psalter then is not wickedness and being sinful or scoffers, but the tone is blessedness. You know, people often will speak of the eight Beatitudes 
it might be more proper to say something like the 800 because there are so many expressions of the blessedness that God gives to us. The Psalter begins with the word blessing and it is repeated many times in the Psalms. So to understand what that means, I have just a couple of brief descriptions from some of our biblical friends. First of all, Nahum Sarna says that it is happiness or blessing. That is, listen to the characteristics, deep-rooted, penetrates the very depths of one's being and is serious and enduring. Deep-rooted. That's a really important understanding of blessing. It isn't a shallow experience of God's gift to us, but it's got firm, deep roots. It penetrates the very depths of our being because it's God-given. And God is going to give something that is sturdy and sure, serious and enduring. Um, Sarna um, begins by saying Asherah is happiness or blessing. So very often when we read the Psalms or different passages, it will use the word happy rather than blessed. Happy is the person who takes refuge in God. Happy is the person who does this or that. And that's certainly um, a translation that is, is acceptable. I prefer blessed myself because happiness can so easily be associated with things that are not deep rooted. I was so happy when I got a new car. That's not the same deep rootedness as, as blessing. Blessing that goes to the very core of one's being. Also, it is something that is received. Happiness is something, sometimes things that we think we cause ourselves. I was so happy when I lost weight. I did it. I made myself happy. Whereas blessing, this word ashare, is about being the recipient. God is the, the source of all blessing. God is the one who makes it deep-rooted. Elizabeth Nagel talks about blessing a bit further. She says, God's blessings are not merely abundant. They are extravagant beyond all expectation and imagining. God gives us so much more than we can ask or imagine. God gives us what we haven't earned. God's blessing is freely given and abundant, extravagant. Uh, we might think of the story of the prodigal son, or actually, how about prodigal father? Because the father is the one who was extravagant, who goes and kills the, the fatted calf and has a great feast. That's an example of the blessing of God, which is abundant and extravagant, much more than is expected. So the Psalter then begins with blessing. And it assures us that God's a blessing is something that is not temporary, but it abides. Let's read, rather than just read, let's pray uh, these psalm verses that are expressions of God's blessing. And after we pray those together, let's just take a moment and let those be deeply rooted. Think about them, and is there any particular word or image that strikes you that you want to keep in your heart today? Blessed are those who take refuge in God. How blessed are those whose offense is forgiven, whose sin is blotted out. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people God has chosen as his heritage. Blessed are they whose trust is in the Lord. Blessed is anyone who cares for the poor and the weak. Blessed are those who live in your house, ever singing your praises. Blessed are those whose way is blameless, who walk in the law of the Lord. Blessed are those who keep his decrees, who seek him with their whole heart. 
who also do no wrong, but walk in his ways. If you want to say aloud, nice and loud, any particular word or phrase that is speaking to you. Well, personally, I, um, am, I'm always touched every time we pray, you know, Psalm 84. You know, oh. blessed are those who live in your house ever singing your praises. Ah, oh, wonderful. And it just kind of describes um, the way we live here in the monastery. And I think about, you know, the hundredfold that has been given to me, uh, having left the world, uh, moved out of my little two-room apartment <laughs> and onto this incredible hilltop and, and um, just feel so blessed to live in God's house, singing his praises six times a day. Thank you. Thank you. And it's also a wonderful uh, portrait of the Psalms themselves. You know, we enter into that house of prayer, the house mm -hmm. of the Psalms. Thank you. Anyone else? The word trust, um, I think it's kind of like doing a free fall out of an airplane and just, just trusting that, that God's going to be there. So it, take, it takes all, all you have inside to do that free, free fall and fully trust. Good. Thank you. Yes. Good image. The one I like is Psalm 32.1 whose offense is forgiven, whose sin is blotted out. It speaks of conversion. Ah, yes. Yes, thank you. And it, it doesn't say God did it, but we know that's what it means, that our sin, our offense is forgiven. God is the one who has acted, has given us this blessing. Thank you. So as we reflect on these Psalms, uh, these uh, beatitudes, these blessings, there are some characteristics about them, whether they are the blessings that Jesus announces or the ones that we hear about in the Hebrew scriptures, that they all have some characteristics that are helpful to keep in mind. The first is that these blessings give us a sense of identity. This is saying, this is who I am. You know, I am a person who takes refuge in God. I am a person whose offense is forgiven, who trusts in God, uh, who lives in your house. So it's really helpful at times to put yourself as the person that this is describing. If I can um, just give you a, a very short personal example or experience. At my mother's funeral, we had the gospel was from the Beatitudes. And the reason we chose it is that we said, this is a good description of mom. And so we listened to the Beatitudes putting her name there. Mary was poor in spirit. Mary hungered and thirst for justice and so on. So we can do that as we look at, at various Beatitudes, expressions of blessing in the Psalms, in life, anywhere to see, does this describe who I am? Secondly, it's describing an existing reality. It's not just looking forward to something that's going to happen in the future. Um, blessed are those whose sin is forgiven. Not that it might be forgiven at some point in the future, but this is a reality of God's <clears throat> pouring out blessing in the here and now. In addition to that, it strengthens the whole community with a common vision or value system. So when we look at this and we, we see it as a description, it's not to be just a description of me, but a description of us. Uh, blessed are we if we're the nation whose God is the Lord. If we are the people that God has chosen, blessed are all of us who trust in the Lord. So in describing this as not just individuals, but the whole community, it's subtly 
describing specific actions and attitudes. Uh, so if it says, blessed are those who are just, it doesn't say be just, but it's promoting an attitude, a life of justice. I sometimes have rephrased the commandments as beatitudes. They are encouraging the same actions, but one is telling you to do it. Another one is saying, blessed, you are receiving God's abundant gift if you act this way. Blessed are those who honor their father and mother. Blessed are those who speak honestly. Blessed are those who keep holy the Sabbath day. So sometimes when we see um, commandments, exhortations, whether they are in the Hebrew scriptures or in Jesus' words, we might rephrase them from time to time as seeing this as if you behave this way, you are truly blessed. And then the, the final thing, they include both a promise, you know, you will be, you are blessed. And mandate is perhaps too strong, but it's suggesting, it's encouraging that you behave in a certain way, that you care for the poor and weak, that you trust in the Lord. So if Psalm 1 is this um, entry into the, uh, the whole of the Psalter, we can see that all of the prayers of, this, of the Psalms are somehow expressions of God's blessing. We don't have to see the word blessing in order for it to be talking about blessing. For example, I'm going to start a verse that doesn't have the word blessing, but I think it is a beautiful description of what blessing looks like. I'm going to start the verse, and maybe if you all can, can say it aloud, we'll even hear it. Surely goodness and kindness shall... What? Surely goodness and kindness shall... Follow me all the days of my life. Thank you. And we know that. Where's that from? Psalm 23. Psalm 23 right. The, the Good Shepherd Psalm. Is the word blessing there? No. But that is an expression of blessing. So Psalm 1, with its opening with that word of blessing, can help us to hear and to experience God's blessing, even if the word isn't there. Now I'm going to add a little bit more to that particular verse of blessing. Though it's almost always translated, surely goodness and kindness shall follow me all the days of my life. In Hebrew, it says, surely goodness and kindness shall pursue me all the days of my life. God's goodness, God's loving kindness, God's abundant blessings are pursuing us, not just following us, not just keeping a step or two behind us, but rushing after us to bestow that blessing on us. Yesterday, I said you wanted to learn a bit of Hebrew so that you could speak in heaven. So I'm going to tell you this Hebrew word with a little experience from uh, when I was studying it. We found that Hebrew was much harder to learn than some languages because it has almost no connection with English. There aren't Hebrew words that are easily translated except amen and alleluia. We use those. The Hebrew word for pursue is radaf. We might use our, our letters R-A-D-A-P-H, radaf. So the way that I remembered that word pursue is God is coming right after me. God is coming right after me. You will remember that. Surely goodness and kindness will come right after me. God is pursuing me. That is God's abundant, extravagant blessing. On your handout, <clears throat> there are some suggestions of how you might reflect on the meaning of beatitude. To rephrase divine commands, I suggested that, you know, how blessed are those who, who honor their father and their mother. 
or even um, other teachings of Jesus or in the Hebrew scriptures or exhortations by St. Paul to take a phrase and rephrase it as blessing. For example, when Jesus says, ask and you shall receive, we can rephrase that, blessed are those who ask for they shall receive. Or those who humble themselves shall be exalted as a blessing. Blessed are those who humble themselves, for they shall be exalted. Doing things like this can help us to open our eyes and to experience all of our lives as blessing. All of the Psalter is about blessing, even though we're going to be seen later how many of the Psalms are sad laments, but there's still a blessing embedded in those cries out to God. How blessed are you who dwell in the presence of God? So that's one uh, way that you might reflect on this further. I have another suggestion that you might want to try. You know, during this uh, time of isolation, uh, many of us found different ways to be entertained. And one of those I did with some family members and friends, and we called it the six word challenge. So we would put out a word and we'd say, write about that word with six words. Uh, we used the word pandemic or isolation. We started off with words that we are experiencing right then. But then we talked about all kinds of other things, skydiving, twins, and would find six words to think about that particular um, idea, that word, that experience. And sometimes people would just take six words that came to mind that didn't create a sentence or a poem. Other times it would be a, a sentence. For example, in the, uh, the topic isolation, I cheated. I simply used a phrase, absence makes the heart grow fonder. Six words. That was my experience of isolation. So you might think about, write about beatitude using six words, whether as a, uh, a phrase that's borrowed from someone else um, a sentence you create yourselves, or just simply six words that come to mind when you think about beatitude. We have barely begun to enter Psalm 1, but it looks like it's just about time for a break. Could we do one more little aspect of Psalm 1 and then we'll take a break? Is that all right? Because your next talk is not until 1045, so... Would you turn to the next page? So page 12 on delight. Ah, that's another fabulous word. It occurs many times. If we think about delight, what is that? What does that mean? The Psalm says, how blessed are we when we delight in the Torah of the Lord. It's interesting, when I looked up the, the word delight in the, the Hebrew dictionary, I found that it said specifically to take pleasure in, to give delighted attention. If we're really going to delight in someone or something, we need to look at it, experience it, be attentive to it. It is um, like Beatitudes, something that uh, is more sustained than simply a, a momentary, oops, that was delightful. It's, I found it illuminating in looking at various places where that word occurred in the Psalms or in the, um, the Hebrew scriptures in general. The Hebrew word is chafetz. And I found that it was often translated in very different ways. This word delight, to give this sustained, deep, happy attention, is translated in different ways. So rather than reading all of these verses, I'm just going to note the, the highlighted or the bold words that are different ways that it's translated. Joy, 
desire, be ardently devoted, love, approve, will, please, and delight. Just finding the variety of translations of that particular word opened up to me the possibility of thinking about what it means for us to delight in being in the presence of God. What words might I use to talk about that? Does that mean that I, I experience blessing? That I am overcome with uh, an emotion? We might think about that word delight and find what synonyms or words of experience that you would use for delight. Poets, I think, learn how to talk about and experience delight. You already know from yesterday that one of my favorite poets is Mary Oliver. I do have the title of this book on the resources on the last page of your, of your handout. But I'd like to just read her short poem to give a sense of how she experiences delight and maybe that'll open our own eyes uh, to experience it as well. Every day I see or I hear something that more or less kills me with delight, that leaves me like a needle in a haystack of light. It is what I was born for, to look, to listen, to lose myself inside this soft world, to instruct myself over and over in joy and acclamation. Nor am I talking about the exceptional, the fearful, the dreadful, the very extravagant, but of the ordinary, the common, the very drab, the daily presentations. Oh, good scholar, I say to myself, how can you help but grow wise with such teachings as these? The untrimmable light of the world, the oceans shine the prayers that are made out of grass. It's not a psalm, but I think we could say amen. The psalmists and Mary Oliver and other poets and spiritual writers encourage us to experience delight. Delight in the most ordinary of things. I haven't seen a burning bush, but I've seen a hummingbird, you know, Give attention, take delight. In the psalm, the psalmist is particularly blessed for delighting in the Torah, in the instruction. We sometimes uh, say law of the Lord, but I think keeping Torah as the Hebrew word um, helps us to have a better sense of, of what is being talked about. Father Conrad says that the Torah is how God shapes the soul like a roadmap that guides and identifies landmarks toward a destination. The Torah is the open door to praise through which one has access to interior rooms. So we've got a lot of doors. The Psalm 1, which is the doorway into the Psalter. And the psalmist itself says the Torah is a doorway into praise, into delight, into the experience of God's, God's blessing. So there are some suggestion, suggestions for you to reflect on delight, on uh, blessing along with delight as we have entered into this mansion. So you can go back and reflect on the picture, on the psalm as a whole, on who we choose as our life's companions, as our associates, on the meaning of blessing and of delight, and enjoy your morning.